So the question that we are addressing in this series is, do you want to be happy? We're going to talk today about happiness and savory. The third answer to the question, do you want to be happy, then savor the moment. As St. Augustine of Hippo observed uh, around the year 400, almost before we finish asking the question, do you want to be happy, the other person has already answered yes. So in other words, the desire for happiness is universal. We could even say that the inclination to happiness is part of human nature. Now it's no surprise that authors have been writing about happiness for millennia. Even the ancient Greek philosopher Aristotle spoke of happiness as the goal of every human life and human community. As you might recall, for those of you who were here, Father Ben Bradshaw asked this very question in his third presentation in December. And just in case you were wondering, he and I did not compare notes. So he had, I had no idea what was going on. He had no idea. Do we need to make some adjustment? We're going to try to turn the lights off. Right oh, OK. All right. So sadly, the topic of happiness was suppressed for centuries through the modern era. It resurfaced in the 20th century, and it is completely, or it's becoming completely central to our lives now. So we're providing five answers to the question, do you want to be happy? We're proceeding through it, and I'm asking it because, I'm asking it five different ways, because circumstances might lend itself to one answer over the other. We will identify those different circumstances in the next presentation. And I'm asking now that we review the answers to the question up to this point. Do you want to be happy? Now the first answer was give thanks always in difficult times and in easy times. The second answer is focus upon the true, the good, and especially the beautiful. Because beauty exists objectively. We can seek it. The answer for today's question, do you want to be happy, is savor the moment. Savor the experience. Savor the sensation. Savor every dimension of the time. Now, there are all kinds of resources. And if you look on the handout that's sitting at the table, I've given you some of the internet resources at the bottom that you can look at for yourself. One benefit of happiness resurfacing in the 20th century is that we now have methods to measure what produces happiness. The results of this research confirm what we Catholics believe, what we celebrate, how we live, and how we pray ever since Jesus Christ was engaged in his earthly ministry. Social scientific research on happiness indicates that you can increase your happiness by simply focusing your attention. Now, as we all know, to focus our attention is becoming increasingly more difficult. Do I hear an amen? Amen. amen? amen. OK. Now last time, we talked about focusing upon beauty. What the social scientific research indicates is even more basic than that. And this measurable action is called savoring. Savoring is noticing or appreciating the positive aspects of life. The positive counterpoint to coping. Savoring is more than pleasure. It is also involving mindfulness and conscious attention to the experience of pleasure. When we engage in 
deeper levels of attention, of mindfulness, we assign meaning and importance to a memory that can later be recalled as vividness as if we were reliving it. Let me say that again. When we give our attention to an experience, when we savor the moment, we place it in our memory so that we can relive it again. Savor comes from the Latin word to taste. By analogy, what is needed to savor an experience in a positive way is to engage fully in the experience and to be conscious and mindful of every detail you take in and to appreciate it fully. Our mind brings back the sights, the sounds, the smells, the feelings of the experience. We can savor the experience and save the benefits of savoring for a later time. The photo here shows the first Holy Communion of our sons Joel and Joshua in 2010. I happen to remember my first Holy Communion from 1970 as if it was yesterday. Maybe some of you can experience and recall the same thing. That is a moment of savoring. Now, sadly, most people fight their own inclination toward happiness. Researchers found that the majority of subjects they studied were not able to identify anything that they had done recently to increase their happiness or life satisfaction. Now, if you want, we can call this the Charlie Brown syndrome. Uh, recently, our family watched a Charlie Brown Christmas, right? And everybody knows that the reason Charlie Brown is a comical character is that no matter what he does to undercut happiness, somebody still comes along and loves him and helps him and assists him. Okay, and we all know the wonderful scene uh, where he has that very skinny Christmas tree and everybody gathers around and all of a sudden it's beautiful. Okay, his resident theologian is Linus. And for those of you who don't know, Linus is actually the second pope after Peter. So I'm sure Charles Schultz knew exactly what he was doing by calling Linus the character in Peanuts. Okay, Linus completely upends a utilitarian approach which is contrary to happiness and what we've been fighting in the modern era, okay? So if you notice here, Charlie Brown asks him the question, do you ever think much about the future, Linus? Oh, yes, all the time. What do you think you'd like to be when you grow up? And his answer is completely unpredictable in a modern utilitarian way, but in a classical way in a biblical way. It's outrageously happy. Most of us wouldn't expect an answer like that. We're expecting him to do something. But you notice that Linus identifies for us exactly what our mission in life is. In one set of studies, depressed participants were invited to take a few minutes, once a day, to relish something that they usually hurry through. For example, a meal, taking a shower, finishing the workday, or walking to the subway. When it was over, they were instructed to write down in what ways they had experienced the event differently, as well as how they felt different with the times compared to how they rushed through it. In another study, healthy students and community members were instructed to savor two pleasurable experiences per day by reflecting on each for two to three minutes. Two to three minutes. For some of us, that seems like an eternity, especially when you get that text message and you're not answering it right away. Okay. The idea was to try to make pleasure last as long as possible. 
And in all these studies, those participants who were prompted to practice savoring regularly showed significant increases in happiness and reductions in depression. So the prescription that Dr. Fred Bryant provides for happiness is actually rather simple. It's difficult to practice, though. Just do one thing. Don't hurry through it. <coughs> Slow down. Appreciate what you have. We all know that we should slow down, stop, savor the experience of life more, but temptations to distractions overwhelm us. In our consumeristic society, we are convinced that more is better, no matter what the more is. Interestingly, Jesus knew such temptations. He knew that his disciples would be distracted, so what he wanted to do is he wanted to draw them even closer to himself and to rest in him, to savor his presence, despite all of the internal and external distractions. I want to give you two examples of how Jesus draws us closer. Now, first of all, you all know about St. Peter's profession of faith in Matthew 16, 16. We Catholics quote it pretty often. The Lord tells Peter, Upon you I will build my church, right? Now, as a kind of test of faith, though, the Lord tells his disciples about his upcoming passion, death, and resurrection. Almost as if to say that he, Peter, and Jesus are all like a class above everybody else. Peter pulls Jesus to the side and says, May you be spared, Master. God forbid that something like that would happen to you. And Jesus turns on Peter and says, Get behind me, Satan. Satan is the Greek word, and it means adversary. Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block, a scandal to me. You do not savor is what it says in Greek. You do not savor, or you are not mindful of the things of God. Rather, you savor, you are mindful of the things of man. There aren't many times when that word savor is used in the New Testament, but that's one of them. It's a huge contrast. So what are the things of God that Jesus wants Peter to savor, to be mindful of? Now the answer is given immediately in the verses following this in Matthew 16. If you had your Bibles, you want to do a Bible study on this, you can look at it. What Jesus does is he provides words and then he provides actions. And the words present total discipleship to Jesus and total reward of eternal life in the Holy Trinity in the presence of the angels and the saints. The second example that I want to give you about savoring, lest we become overwhelmed by the nail marks, if you will, and the splinters of the cross, which is there at the end of Matthew 16, in the very next chapter, Christ the Lord takes Peter, James, and John, and they go to the top of a mountain. Do you get the contrast here? First, he says, get behind me, Satan. You've got to follow the cross. Take up the cross every day. Follow me. And then he says, come with me to the top of the mountain. It happens six days later. Now, the six days, of course, is very relevant because we're still in the same week when he had reprimanded Peter after Peter's profession of faith. It also reminds us that God creates in six days. On the seventh, he rested, remember? And what did he do on the sixth day? He created humanity. All right. So Jesus takes Peter, James, and John. They go up a high mountain, 
And then Jesus shows him something that no human being has ever seen before. Get that. No human being has ever seen before. But it's the very thing that every one of us sitting in this room crave. We crave to see God. We crave to come face to face with God. We crave a moment of intimacy with God. Our whole soul pines for that one little infinite time. And then it happens. Jesus is transfigured. His face radiates glory. Moses and Elijah are speaking to him. Peter sees it, hears it, and he says, Lord, it is good that we are here. That's savory. So if you want to be happy, savor the moment. Savor every dimension of the moment. If you are new to St. Leo's Lunch, we're really glad you're here. Thanks for joining us. We hope that you will join us in the future as well. We ask you to uh, come along, bring your friends. If you hear something here that has blessed you in a wonderful way, we invite others to come along. We have cards. Feel free to hand out a business card. Invite them to St. Leo's Lunch also. And for those of you who are looking to worship God, to savor the moment, um, there are a few Catholics in the room. We'd love to have you come join us for worship at a Catholic parish, and we can tell you exactly what those times are and when they are. I'm 71 years old. I'm in my 33rd city, 19th state. I was born a cradle Catholic, left the church in my early 20s, and came back about 25 years ago. I've got five kids, 16 grandkids, two great-grandkids, and one in the way. That's just superfluous to what has gone on in my life over the last number of years. Those of you that have not been to MMOS, don't miss this year's. Go and keep on going. That was the first change in what was going on in my life. I came back to the church in the early 90s, was going to daily mass, thought I was a great Catholic. Went to M.M. West, listened to uh, Father Larry Richards, bingo. Within a few weeks, I joined Fishers of Men here, then went on and started grouping with a group of guys that I didn't even know what they were doing, okay? For those of you who have made Crucio, you know what I'm talking about. For those of you who have not made Crucio, another major game changer. So I start grouping with these guys. I'm enjoying it. We have to each Saturday talk about our week before, our piety, our study, and our action. What are we doing each week to make ourselves a little bit better? If you don't think that Every coincidence is the Holy Spirit stepping in. I read on one of the little cards that these guys were carrying Curcio. And I thought, well, I'll check and see what that is. And it took me weeks because I don't have a memory. So for probably a month, I carried that around in my brain. Finally, look it up. And I see that there's a Curcio coming up in about two weeks. So I thought, well, maybe I ought to do that. But, you know, I don't have the guts to just jump out and do things. So that following Saturday, the grouping breaks up, and Rick Alsobrook looks at me across the table and he says, have you thought about making Crucio? The Holy Spirit, guys. I made Crucio, and let me tell you, it is a major game changer. My wife is Jewish. I'm, I'm a devout Catholic at this point. One of the best things I ever did for my Jewish wife was to make Crucio. It makes you more aware of every 
thing you do for two reasons. Number one, you get these lessons that are just very intense that bring you up to snuff. And second of all, every Saturday you sit down with your group of buds and you talk about what you did or didn't do. It holds you accountable. It's one of the best things you can do. So basically, what I'm saying to you all is here's a guy who was totally broken. We don't even want to talk about what I did during my days from, away from the church, okay? Uh, I'd be embarrassed to tell you a lot of the stories. But the more you get involved with your faith, and th this group of guys right here, I'm looking around, there's a bunch of Kyristas right here in this room. So if you haven't made, all you have to do is turn to the guy next to you. He probably has. Talk about it. Think about it. Do it. And if you're Catholic, after you do it, get your wife to come along too. I'm watching these married couples, young married couples that have made Crucio. David, in my line, made a total difference, didn't it? You and your wife. Okay. There's a bunch of married couples that have made it. And the earlier they can make it, the more you find out that your number one job in life is to get to heaven. And your second job in life is to bring as many as you can with you. You're the priest of your family. The statistics are that if you go to church and take your kids with you to church, 80% of your kids are going to stay in the church. If you don't go to church and your wife takes them to church, less than 40% stay in the church. That's how important you guys are to your family, to your surroundings, to everything you do. Think about it. Pray about it. But don't miss the chance to make Chrysia.